Hi guys, it is a lovely late summer evening here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. What used to be called in some places the last night of summer. This is Sunday night, September 4th, 2022, the, day, the night before Labor Day, which is traditionally thought of the last hurrah for summer, although if you live in LA, you might not agree with that. But anyway, since it is Sunday, I am, I guess, thrilled to bring you my Sunday sermon going through all of the various doom and gloom choices. But what I've settled on is I'm going to read an excerpt from this excellent new book, this must read new book called An Inconvenient Apocalypse by Wes Jackson and Robert Jensen. If you have not heard my interview with Robert Jensen from a few nights ago, I strongly suggest you go listen to Robert Jensen explain the state of the planet in his own words in that interview. But we're going to read an excerpt uh, from the chapter Four Hard Questions, Four Hard Questions, and the first and probably hardest question of them all is the question of size. And what we're going, what uh, Wes and Robert, the size they're talking about here is the size of the human population on planet Earth. And you know, the big question, how many humans can the can planet Earth support? Now, of course, you all know my answer. Zero is the optimal number of humans on planet Earth is zero. Uh, in, in the interview, uh, if you listen to my interview, Robert suggests, why don't we aim for four billion? Let's start with the goal of four billion and then go from there. But anyway, this is the official published words of Robert Jensen and Wes Jackson talking about the size of the human population for some intelligent commentary which I'm sure is going to get them labeled as eugenicist. Take it away Robert and Wes. <clears throat> oh boy, he, you know guys already this computer has, uh, let me go back, we're going to go to page, we're going to read, we're going to come in at page 49, and I'm just going to blast, uh, the, the summary is Earth's ecosystems can sustainably support far fewer than 8 billion people, even if everyone were consuming far less energy and material than today. Okay, so let's break that down. For any species, an ecosystem has a carrying capacity. The population size and density that can be sustained in that given place given available resources. No species can increase its population in an ecosystem indefinitely. Eventually, an expanding species will run out of adequate space for its activities, exhaust necessary resources, especially food and water, and be unable to safely dispose of waste products. Eventually, the population of a species that expands beyond its carrying capacity will be reduced by starvation, predation, and disease. Every ecosystem has a carrying capacity, which means the planet Hmm. A collection of ecosystems has a carrying capacity 
for any given species. No one disputes those statements when applied to non-human species, but lots of people believe those rules somehow do not apply to the human species because the human population has expanded so dramatically in our lifetimes, it is tempting to believe that we are the only species not subject to biophysical limits. We don't want to caricature those who disagree with us, but that argument usually goes like this. How many times have you heard this? A couple of centuries ago, Thomas Malthus predicted that human population growth would undercut any gains in rising standards of living because population growth would outrun food production. Yes, the human population has kept increasing from just under 1 billion in his time to nearly 8 billion today, made possible by dramatic increases in food production. So, Malthus was wrong, and anyone who says anything like that is also wrong. As one science writer put it, people who take Malthus seriously, quote, cannot let go of the simple but clearly wrong idea that human beings are no different than a herd of deer when it comes to reproduction." Close quote. In the debate between what are sometimes called the Neo-Malthusians and the Cornucopians, it's easy to reject the extreme versions of either approach. Some Neo-Malthusians have issued specific predictions of coming catastrophes that have proved to be wrong. Hmm. The most well-known example is Paul Ehrlich's 1968 bestseller, The Population Bomb, which began with this proclamation, quote, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. Close quote, you know, meaning 1968. <clears throat> Some cornucopians suggest that there is no limit at all to resource extraction and therefore no limit to population growth. Julian Simon's 1981 book, The Ultimate Resource, updated and reissued in 1996, included a chapter titled, Can the Supply of Natural Resources, Especially Energy, Really Be Infinite? Yes! There you go. We should be wary of predictions. Uh, in an earlier, in an earlier interview with Robert Jensen, I have interviewed him three times. I asked the, you know, basically his opinion of the people claiming humans are going to be extinct sometime between uh, 2026 and 2030, and uh, you, you can imagine his opinion of any clueless moron thinking humans are going to be extinct. Uh, sometime in the next four to eight years. But anyway, I'm getting off course. Back to Wes and Robert. We should be wary of predictions, especially about complex processes that are well beyond our capacity to understand fully, and of course a lot has changed since Malthus. The past two centuries have seen increased yields through the use of fossil energy and industrial methods in agriculture, advances in public health, and unprecedented medical innovation. 
But along with those changes have come rapid climate destabilization and a long list of other ecological crises. The dense energy in fossil fuels and the advanced technology developed since the scientific revolution have dramatically increased food production and also dramatically undermined the stability of virtually all of Earth's ecosystems through increased soil erosion and degradation, widespread chemical contamination, species extinction, and climate disruption. Yep, 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 yep. All life, including human life, no matter how technologically sophisticated we become depends on those ecosystems. What is the sustainable carrying capacity of the planet for Homo sapiens? Estimates vary from 500 million, you know, can you say the now demolished Georgia Guidestones, estimates vary from 500 million to more than one trillion. Actually, Alex Jones is on record as saying there is no reason the Earth cannot support one quadrillion people, every one of them owning a sports car and a powerboat. That's from Alex Jones, and there's people who believe that. Yes. Estimates vary from 500 million to more than 1 trillion, with the majority of studies putting the number at or below 8 billion people. Whatever the answer, the sustainable carrying capacity of the planet for humans has limits. It's likely that humans passed a sustainable limit decades ago, and we are able to avoid the consequences of that reality temporarily through exploitation of more dense energy with more advanced technology. So Rascal is joining in again. She seems to be after a moth over in the corner. We see no reason by we, the, they're talking about Wes and Robert, we see no reason to believe that can go on forever. This conclusion does not mean we, meaning humans, can do nothing but wring our hands while preaching doom and gloom. We can advocate for collectively setting limits as an important part of rational and responsible planning which has to be based on an honest assessment of the conditions under which we live today and can expect to live tomorrow. <clears throat> While climate change is an existential threat, thank you. Here we go, the book hermit argument. While climate change is an existential threat, a focus only on climate can be misleading. Climate disruption is a derivative of overshoot of too many people consuming too much stuff in the aggregate. This is, you know, uh, Ted Turner. My favorite billionaire with five kids was saying 30 years ago. The problem is too many people eating too much stuff. I'm sure every one of his five children and probably 30 grandchildren live in mansions. Okay. If a miracle solution to climate destabilization appeared tomorrow, we would still face multiple cascading crises because human demands on Earth's ecosystems 
are in excess of those ecosystems capacity to regenerate in a time frame relevant to us. Obviously Wes Jackson and uh, Robert Jensen uh, have been listening to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles. This is exactly what I and Book Hermit and anybody else with a brain have been saying. Okay? Get rid of climate change. It makes no difference. Climate change is a derivative of overshoot. It is one ingredient in the toxic stew taking down this planet. Okay, fertility rates are declining in most places, but a slower rate of growth does not solve our problems. At some point in the future, there will have to be significantly fewer people and a lot less stuff, either by our choice or through natural forces that we cannot control. The goal of our planning can be stated simply and clearly. Fewer and less. Fewer people, less stuff. I am so glad that these two College graduates understand the difference between the words fewer and less. Fewer people, less stuff. Many people, including many environmentalists we know, prefer not to talk about the growth of the human population as a problem or about population control as a component of a viable environmental policy. Why? Three reasons seem to push people away from this discussion. The first is that such concerns about population have been associated with a lack of compassion and or racism, ethnocentrism, and class prejudice. Historically, some of the people who worried about population growth, including Malthus, said some pretty cruel things about poor people and argued that any actions based on benevolence toward the poor would be self-defeating because such measures lead to increased population that would make the situation worse. When a legitimate concern about population turns into a rationalization for harsh social Darwinism, it is not surprising that decent people get nervous about the issue. Mm. Those decent people get nervous. Today, some of the most vocal supporters of population control also espouse white supremacist and anti-immigrant sentiments. The ugly history of eugenics lurks in the background as well. As a result, any discussion of population growth as a problem can lead to accusations of bigotry or insufficient understanding of the liberating potential of eco-socialism, which tends to shut down necessary conversations. We are grateful that some environmentalists, such as Eileen Christ, are willing to speak bluntly. Quote, the dismal consequences for Earth and for humanity of an oversized global population are indisputable, close quote. Maybe I will need to interview Eileen at some point. What do you guys think? Okay. The second reason people might avoid the subject is that no one has ever proposed a viable, non-coercive strategy 
for serious population reduction on the scale necessary because no such strategy exists. Raising the status of women and girls along with family planning can reduce birth rates, but not at anywhere near the rate that will be necessary to get to a sustainable population. The most well-known experiment in large-scale limitations on births, China's one-child policy, in place from 1980 to 2016, was controversial on moral and political grounds, and researchers still debate how many births it prevented. That's a question we will never know. The other side of the population equation, and, and Robert talks quite a bit about this uh, in our interview, the other side of the population equation, the death rate is even more vexing. The 20th century saw declines in infant, child, and maternal mortality, along with the invention of medical technology that could extend people's lives. The question about population reduction requires talking not just about how many kids are born, but about how long each person lives. And even fewer people want to talk about that side of the population problem. In the 2009 debate about health insurance and the 2012 presidential election, conservatives whipped up hysteria over, quote, death panels, you know, uh, and I have friends who actually bought into this Alex Jones crap about death panels. The argument that moving toward universal health care would result in bureaucrats making decisions about who lives and who dies. The ease with which some politicians were able to scare people with such claims indicates just how far the United States is from an honest discussion on the subject of the appropriate level of intervention to prevent death, especially as we age. We need such a debate about setting policy not only on when to withdraw care from the terminally ill, but also on the wisdom of using a range of life-extending medical procedures such as heart bypasses, organ transplants, and all that other stuff to keep, you, you know, the uh, medical and pharmaceutical energy rolling in money. All right. While we, while we need to talk about birth control, we, just as crucially, we need to talk about whether to continue the current level of death control in the United States, we ration health care by the ability to pay, which means those with resources can maximize the use of advanced medical care to extend life. If we were to institute a truly, if we were to institute a truly equitable system of health care distribution, the question of death control cannot be avoided. The discomfort with this issue does not render the questions irrelevant. As the author of a recent study of human lifespans put it, quote, many of the key problems we now face as a species are second order effects of reduced mortality, close quote. Also important to social stability is what is called the dependency ratio, the relationship between people of working age and those who are not working. The youth dependency ratio includes those under the age of 15, and the elderly dependency ratio includes those 65 and older. A high dependency ratio means working people carry a heavier burden 
to support those who are not economically active. So if birth rates were to continue to decline, slowing population growth and people were to continue to live longer, the dependency ratio will rise over time with dramatic consequences. In the words of an international team of journalists, quote, the strain of longer lives and low fertility leading to fewer workers and more retirees threatens to upend how societies are organized and may also require a reconceptualization of family and nation." Close quote. The third reason that people may avoid the population issue is that, whether acknowledged or not, everyone recognizes that raw population numbers are meaningless without attention to per capita consumption, a question that we raised in earlier chapters and will continue to emphasize. That means talking about limits. Imposing limits requires that we distinguish between basic needs, what we truly cannot live without, such as food, water, clothing, and shelter, social needs, what is required for humans to flourish, or what we might call enrichment activities such as the arts, and luxuries that we will not be able to support. E.g., not only private jets for the wealthy, but also routine air travel for the middle class. It also means talking about, uh-oh, redistribution of wealth, not only within societies, but between countries. Those choices require planning within a political process that is committed to the dignity of all people and global solidarity, which requires a willingness to pursue policies with the goal of a rough equality. No such planning has yet happened, and no such political process currently exists. Such a process must start with a commitment to a dramatic, yes, a dramatic reduction in per capita consumption in the developed economies and a recognition that the developing world must abandon the goal of achieving the level of consumption that exists in the affluent countries today. Those goals are not easy to achieve, nor are they fair to everyone, but they are the task ahead. Those are the impediments not just to adopting policies, but to even talking about the issue of human numbers and consumption, what Wes Jackson has long described as the dual population problem, the population of people and the population of people's things. Behind all the denial is the techno-optimism that assumes we will always invent our way out of any problem which may turn out to be the biggest impediment to meaningful change. If we could overcome these impediments, what should be our goal? What is a sustainable human population? We don't pretend to know, and failed attempts at prediction in the past have made people understandably wary. But it is safe to say that if our goal is long-term sustainability, the number is well below 8 billion people. A lot fewer people consuming a lot less. We don't know what the carrying capacity of the planet might have been in the past, 
before agriculture unleashed the ecological drawdown, before the concentrated assault of the industrial world intensified the degradation of ecosystems, that that is irrelevant because we have to plan for the current degraded state of the world's ecosystems. As a starting point for policy making, we think it makes sense to assume that ca the carrying capacity is no more than half of the current population living with no more than half of the energy and materials the world consumes in the aggregate today. That's a good place to start. Reasonable people with good track records on understanding ecological limits suggest that the human population could stabilize at about 2 billion. That was, by the way, the human population in 1927. One recent analysis concluded that Earth could support 3 billion people. To get this conversation going in public, what is important is not a specific number, but rather a recognition of the scale of change that is needed. Rejecting a growth economy and the irrational consumption of consumer capitalism would make it possible to sustain a human population that is likely no more than half of the current population and likely half of that again which means two billion. Finding a humane and democratic path to that dramatically lower number will not be easy. It may not be possible. In fact, if human history is any guide, it is almost certainly not possible. But rather than turn away we should acknowledge the reality of ecological carrying capacity while pursuing social justice goals and rejecting racist and ethnocentric projects. Refusing to acknowledge difficult problems does not allow us to escape them. Instead, denial of reality opens up space for people peddling pseudo-solutions. When reasonable people stay silent, the voices of unreasonable people dominate. <clears throat> Progressives who are unwilling to address the issue of human numbers and consumption seed the CEDE, seed this terrain to political actors without progressive values who want to use ecological crises to pursue an ugly agenda. To press the question of population and consumption is not reactionary, but rather an attempt to forestall reactionary political projects. We pause here to note the obvious. The analysis just presented is not new, nor are we alone today in this analysis. For a half century, insightful scholars have been making these points. As a young professor, <clears throat> Jackson, Wes Jackson was thinking about carrying capacity when he proposed a curriculum for survival studies and collected articles with prescient early warnings in his book Man and the Environment, the first edition of which came out in 1971. In the early 1970s, Paul Ehrlich and John Holden all offered their iPad their IPAT concept to capture the impact of human activity on the environment by looking at population, affluence, and technology. In their 1972 book, The Limits to Growth, Danella and Dennis Meadows and co-authors used computer modeling to warn that humans were moving beyond Earth's carrying capacity. After years of these authors being dismissed as alarmist, an increasing number of people are recognizing they were right. 
William Catton, one of the founders of environmental sociology, laid out the argument and evidence regarding overpopulation and consumption in his 1980 book that brought the term overshoot to our attention. The ecologist William Reese and Mathis Wackernagel developed ecological footprint analysis to make the unsustainability of contemporary societies easier to grasp, publishing our ecological footprint in 1996. Such work continues with scholar activists such as Richard Heinberg and his colleagues at the Post Carbon Institute. With these analyses in mind, we reiterate an important point too often overlooked. At the core of what people call environmental problems, including and perhaps especially climate change, is too many people consuming too much energy. Specific threats to ecosystem health are derivatives of the size of the population and its consumption. There are no long-term solutions to the ecological crisis without coming to terms with that reality. A group of ecologists recently stated the obvious, but such statements need to be repeated. Large population size and continued growth are implicated in many societal problems. Yeah, like 100% of them. I don't know if my battery on my camera crashed 15 minutes or not, but I'm going to wrap up this rant and go uh, get a little bit of Netflix to uh, wind down from all of this doom and gloom. I highly suggest you try to take a break from the doom and gloom tomorrow from the labor of doom and gloom and get out there and enjoy it while you still can with your little dog. My guys. I don't believe it. The camera is still on.